I just wanted to remind you about the children's resource page. It's on the Bournemouth Community Church website. Link is right here. Jot it down. Go check it out. There's links to playlists on our BCC Kids YouTube page and it's updated weekly with the latest Children's Church Live video too. So here's the link again. Jot it down. Go check it out. Let's stay connected. Let's keep adventuring with Jesus. I'll see you soon. us because it gives us a real sense of belonging in a big church. Life group is important to me because you get to know people better. It's a great way of connecting with new people our age. We really love life groups. Life groups are really important to us. For a starter to find out that there are people as crazy as you. Meeting new people. Uh, it's being family. There's a real sense of family. In a group of people who love you, who support you. Because it gives us the opportunity to uh, build relationships. It's great to learn together and to pray for each other. We find that it's a safe place. Sundays can be a bit of a crowd and it's more anonymous, but Life Group is really quite personal, which is lovely. And where we have lots of fun together. And where we can share our hearts and we can pray for each other. There's lots of support, intimacy and love. You can be open, you can be honest, you can ask any question. You can be encouraged. And an opportunity to make new friendships and have fun. But also to have a laugh with. You can be really helped. During the week, we, we continue talking to each other and improving that connection during, through WhatsApp. Time to just connect with God, with those around you. And on Life Group evenings, we really dig in deep into the Word. We, uh, we chew on the meat and its proper study. When we do discussions, I take loads of notes, which is good. I, would, I couldn't do us because it gives us a real sense of belonging in a big church. Life group is important to me because you get to know people better. It's a great way of connecting with new people our age. We really love life groups. Life groups are really important to us. For a starter to find out that there are people as crazy as you. Meeting new people. Uh, it's being family. There's a real sense of family. In a group of people who love you, who support you. Because it gives us the opportunity to uh, build relationships. It's great to learn together and to pray for each other. We find that it's a safe place. Sundays can be a bit of a crowd and it's more anonymous, but Life Group is really quite personal, which is lovely. And where we have lots of fun together. And where we can share our hearts and we can pray for each other. There's lots of support, intimacy and love. You can be open, you can be honest, you can ask any question. You can be encouraged. And an opportunity to make new friendships and have fun. But also to have a laugh with. You can be really helped. During the week, we, we continue talking to each other and improving that connection during, through WhatsApp. Time to just connect with God, with those around you. And on Life Group evenings, we really dig in deep into the Word. We, uh, we chew on the meat and its proper study. When we do discussions, I take loads of notes, which is good. I, would, I couldn't do it without Life Life's a Life Group. It's togetherness in the current isolation. And there's always cake. A big thank you to the life groups who've been a big encouragement in our walk with the Lord. Bye. I love life group. <laughs> Stop it. It doesn't work, does it? Yeah, it's going to work. Okay. Ready? One. <laughs> Hey families, if you're anything like me, I love to have fun all week long. And where can you do that, you ask? It's the BCC Kids YouTube page. It's the home of Children's Church Live, which we hold here in the kids' studio each week where we journey, explore and adventure with Jesus. It's great fun. There's also loads of other videos, games, challenges, songs, crafts that you can pick out and watch 
all week long on the page, whether you're in Beams, Oaks and Acorn, Sparklers, Five Alive or Seven Up. Great fun to be had on the BCC Kids YouTube page. Link is in the description. I'm going to have a Belgian bun. Mmm. Mmm. You can eat food while watching the videos too. Brilliant. Uh, best lesson of life is play American football and hit people. <laughs> That's a great one. Uh, my name's Simon McLean. Uh, I am by trade a biomedical scientist, uh, but I am currently the haematology laboratory manager at the Royal Bournemouth Hospital. Uh, I got to Alpha through quite a, a circumventional method. Uh, I'm really pleased that Keith did invite me because it probably is something that I wouldn't have got the courage to attend myself as much as I may have been interested in it. And having him there and figuratively holding my hand through the process helped enormously. Something had just prompted me to, to ask him, tell me as a man of religion what do you think of and I didn't even get as far as asking what that question would be because he said let me just stop you right there I'm a man of faith not a man of religion he then comes along and says oh there's an opportunity for an alpha course and I think you'd be really good just felt like a safe environment to be able to share some experiences that were potentially quite painful and raw and you didn't feel unable to do that. You, you felt that nobody was going to make any judgments, they were all there listening to your experiences and it pretty much didn't matter what you said, you were going to have support and people who would talk you honestly through what you had heard and give you something good to hear. Um, but because we had a mixture of some people who were unsure but looking for answers, some people who were fairly happy with where they were within their faith, and other people who knew exactly and were there to assist in the conversations, just I, I, I felt a warmth and I felt a, a willingness to, to open the door and then that just grew from there to the point where I was happy on Easter Sunday to say yes to Jesus. I would absolutely recommend people going along to Alpha at whatever stage you may be, if it's at the right end where you, you don't believe at all, but there might just be a little inkling, or you know, you've, you've stepped away from the faith for a bit and you want to just go into an environment where you can discuss it, absolutely, and yeah, in, invite people along. It's a great, great experience. Uh, it's been a wonderful journey and I've met some amazing people and the church feels like a family and it is something that I desperately needed at that point in my life and I will forever be grateful for that.
everybody. We have started. <laughs> Sorry. Everyone, great to see you. Good morning to those joining online. Great to have you with us as well. Yeah, if you're new here this morning, we're so glad to have you. Welcome to BCC Team Sunday. We're going to be celebrating one another and honouring one another as well for part of the morning. And the tables over there are going to be laden with food and goodies for us to enjoy afterwards. Yes, special reward for everybody. Now we've got a little special guest over here to our left. Yeah. It's Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, James. <laughs> Hey, James, congratulations. Something happened in January. What was that, James? Well, hey, to Claire. It's cool. Amazing. So pleased for you, bro. And for you, Claire. Well done for saying yes. <laughs> Do you want to pray? Why don't we stand together in readiness to worship the Lord together? Let's pray. That's good. Amen. A scripture from Hebrews 10 says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies to wash with pure water. Yeah, thank you, Lord, for this day. God, thank you that we can draw near to you, that you invite us to draw near to you and you promise that in that you will draw near to us. Lord, we present ourselves before you this morning as a living sacrifice, Lord, to worship you, to lift up your name, to magnify you, to glorify you, to exalt you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you are good. Your love endures forever. We worship you this morning. Amen. Let's do praise as well.
is able. God is able. He will never fail. He is Almighty God. Greater than all we see, greater than all we ask. He has done great things. Lift it up, lift it up. He defeated the grave. Raised to life, our God is able. In his name, we've overcome for the Lord, our God is able. Let's sing God is with us. God is with us. God is on.
Christ alone. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come. Trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless, I stand before the throne. Let's sing that again when he shall come. When he shall come. Trumpet sound, thank you, Lord. Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone. Faultless I stand before the throne, Christ alone, cornerstone. James and Emily really appreciate you guys and when we've got a bit less of a band it, it really relies on us as a body coming together and lifting our voices strongly as one before the Lord doesn't it so I feel like if we can just continue on worshiping you know knowing that what this song speaks about about Christ being our cornerstone what we are built on our rock our firm foundation and you know many of us are facing storms in life at the moment, whether right now or have been or are to come, there's such a truth that speaks about, you know, who Jesus is to us, all that he's won for us and this beautiful exchange of what he's taken on the cross and what he's promised and giving us. He's taken our pain, our sin, our shame. He's giving us hope, freedom, new life. So as we come before God this morning, let us roll these burdens onto him, cast these things onto him, give him the worries, the concerns, the storms of, of this life and allow him to be at work in your heart, setting you free, freedom for the captives. That's what Jesus brings. That's what he promises. Beauty for ashes, joy and gladness instead of mourning. James, will you continue to lead us? And as we just continue to speak out these words, to sing this, to bring our worship before God, let's really allow our hearts and our mouths to speak these truths and to believe them, to lay hold of them for ourselves. He is our cornerstone. Our hope is built on nothing less, nothing other than Jesus, His righteousness and all His one for us. So let's give it something, guys. Let's really join our voices together and continue the worship. Yes, yeah, just sing that chorus again. Christ
We thank you, Lord, that we declare that you are Lord of all. The Word of God reminds us that in all things you are. And it's to you, Father God, we give our worship. To you, the Son of God, Jesus, for dying on the cross, for raising again and from the third day. Hallelujah, what a Savior. You died for my sins. I'm forgiven because you set me free of the work of the cross. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, you're so welcome. You're so welcome to show us Jesus in the Father's love. You're so welcome to receive our honor and glory as well. So we're here. Lord, in a troubled world, in a world that is so, so all over the place, there is truth that our God reigns and that he is Lord through all the storms of life. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. And the people of God said together, and the people of God said together, Good. Please have a seat. And whilst you're having a seat, just say hi to someone briefly. Don't get out of your seat. We're going to do that in a moment. Hello, Faith. Everybody. <laughs> Just reorientate you around. Hello in the balcony. Are we all awake? Yes, they are there. Hello downstairs. Are you all awake? Okay. BCC has been in existence for over 100 years. And you know what? It's all about the pastors at the front. It's not about you. It is all about me. And so today is the award ceremony for me. For me. For me. The 100 years, because we are, one of our important values is being family. And it's not about me, it's about us. You see, the amazing thing of God's work, what he has done, is he calls us to be part of the body of Christ. Isn't that amazing? You know, this morning that you are part of the body of Christ if you love him. And the amazing is you're also part of the family of God if you love him. That's just amazing. We get, we get adopted into his family. We become sons and daughters. And part of that family ship, as it were, is that we get to play together in serving the Lord and doing his stuff with him. It's pretty good, isn't it? So good. So what's this day about? Why are we doing this today? Yeah, so we want to celebrate everybody as being part of the team who's so graciously and generously served week in, week out. And also just to say, anybody who we don't specifically mention right now from the front, we still love you, we're still thankful for you, you mean just as much. We're just giving some people a little special mention. So. And, and on the screen will be uh, Nikki's personal email address if you're offended, okay? And you can write to her and tell her exactly what you think of her. They you won't get my do that. out-of-office reply. <laughs> <laughs> so if we, if we call you guys um, up this morning, please come up and come onto this little stage here and stay here until... There are so many, um, but we just want to make a little acknowledgement of just a few of us, which represents us as a whole. So our first one is James Payne. Where are you, James? He hasn't been... Oh, his, 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 his daughter's going, oh, no. Come on down. Here he comes. James is a newbie in our tank with his family as well, and they just got stuck in in so many different ways. So uh, James is coming on down. I'll shake his hand. Who's next? All right. Following James, we've got Nate, Joshua, and Amelia. Are they in the building? Nate, Joshua, and Amelia. Well done. Well done. Come on. Just stay down. up here. <laughs> Part of the youth. Oh, here they come. This staircase is getting a great use this morning. Here we come. There's at least two of them. That's great. Okay, and also uh, another one to come on down or come on up, whichever way we look at it. Jill Payne. I know Jill. Jill served in so many different ways. Come on, Jill. Thank you. This is, this is actually a marriage certificate for being married to Owen. So uh, that's an amazing job. Well done. Love you. More blessing. Is more blessing in the building this morning? Come on, more blessing. Come on up. You have just jumped straight in. We are thankful for you. Come on up, Noblesse. Come around. 
So first day here, she said to Andy, I need a job. Help me, give me a job. You're welcome. Stand up the prayer, the more blessings. Thank you for getting stuck in. Patricia and Megan. Patricia and Megan, probably two. They're probably behind the desk serving as we speak. These guys do so much part of our online streaming service and everything, so thank you to on. them. And uh, also connected with that sort of team is uh, Dave Revel, and I don't think Dave is about this morning. Dave, if you're online, we love you. Thank you for serving and for teaching the team as well. We so, so appreciate you. Yeah, let's do it. And uh, this one is for Sarah Dallimore. She might not be here, but we'll get one of the Dallimore crew to come on up. Sarah serves in the Lifehouse and has done so all the way through COVID as well. Thank you, Sue. Come and share that. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. And the next one is? Mr. Mike Pennington. You've got a long walk to the front there, Mike. Thanks, Mike, for being part of the team. All you do here, we appreciate you. Yeah, Mike, you've done an excellent job. And one that um, some of us benefit from as well is that uh, we are, are shadowed by usually Adrienne Wilson and also uh, David Fry. They make sure that the staff team is behaving themselves and regularly come. So, David, on behalf of the team, would you just come and say, we want to say thank you for looking after the staff team as well. Bless you, man. So these are some of the teams that actually go to make as part of a body. And it's not just about Sundays, it's about all the individual things that we do throughout the week and where you serve. So if you're in your job and you love the Lord Jesus, you're part of this team. You're being Jesus wherever you are. But internally as a family has always functioned, someone puts the knives and forks on the table before you eat, someone washes up. Um, someone does this, someone does that. So we've got things like Sunday host teams, welcomers, stewarders, coffee makers, fire officers, connecting, Sunday production, VP sound, online sound, producers, camera operators, children and youth team, Thursday, Friday and Sunday, Alpha team, Lifehouse team, Sages team, events team, the Life Centre days, open days, holiday clubs, prayer teams, worship teams, Sunday services and hosts and preachers. Yeah, that's you. And also trustees team. Thank you, trustees. And life group leaders. And the list goes on and on and on. But you know, we're called together. And in a moment, Tim is going to actually bring us some teaching about the fact that we can build better together as we start to look in what Nehemiah and Ezra actually did way, way back. And we see that so many different people, these are just a representation of you guys, actually make us a great team, make us a great family. So would you just stand and I want to pray a blessing over you if that is okay. Father, you're an amazing God who calls us into family life. We are, as I look out, and I think Phil looked out a couple of weeks ago, as we look out, we come from so many different countries, places, backgrounds and situations but because of you Lord Jesus we are family father we don't take one another for granted and if we do we're sorry and Lord Jesus you often say to those that you met what can I do for you and many replied Lord would you have mercy on us we ask, Lord, that you'd have mercy on us as a family, but also that you'd build us up as a family to be a blessing to one another so that people might see that they know you because of us, as John describes in his letter. Bless this family, I pray, young and old, together. Amen. Amen. Guys, have a seat. That's an amazing. And afterwards... Afterwards, um, we're going to eat together as well. Now, I'm coming down here because I'm probably going to need some, I'm going to need some help from some kids. So, um, does anybody who's under the age of 10 know the name of this? This thing, this thing. And under the age of 10, so, uh, okay, let me come down here. I think this was the first hand that came up. Yes, yes, young man. What, who's this? 
zebra. A zebra. Does, do you know her special name? No. No? Okay, that's a good answer. No. Uh, so, does anybody else know who this... <laughs> That is such a relaxing R. We just uh, yes. Deborah. That's right. It's Deborah the zebra. Yeah. Good job. So do you know why we have Deborah the zebra? Because she looks cool. She does look cool. Yeah. And we have Deborah the zebra because the Bible tells us that as older folks. We should help younger folks, younger people, children, etc., to walk in the ways of the Lord, to do the things that God teaches us to do. And one of the things that we have is Deborah, and she is a facilitator for when we have something which we call our offering. And we, hey, we've been doing and talking about our offering this morning because we've all offered our time and talents and presents. But Deborah takes sometimes our money, and we give our money on a Sunday morning, and we, the kids put their offering in here. And you know what, kids? That is absolutely amazing to do that. And it reminds us adults, and it reminds me especially, that God has given so much to us that on a Sunday or other days, just that simple practical act of giving something back to God and to the work of the local church is a worship moment for us. The Bible tells us as well, you know, kids and adults, and some of us need reminding, don't we, as adults, that Jesus talked about um, a lady who had nothing and she gave everything, just the tiniest small coin. So it's never about the amount. And God actually says in his word as well that he loves people who give cheerfully people who actually give with a good heart, not resentfully. Hey, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up with my family, sharing was a big thing. Who likes sharing? It, it's not natural, is it? Because when we're little kids, we go, that's mine. And I'm not sure, Mike, I want to just share that with you. What's the benefit of sharing it with you, Mike? But we teach our kids, we teach our family that sharing, when we have more of something, helps other people to feel that they belong and also are part of what we do. And so, as we start over the next sort of four to eight weeks, we're going to be reminding ourselves about these small little things that we do and why they're here. And Deborah the Zebra is one of them. That the small amount that we give, actually, God takes and multiplies into great kingdom works and that is absolutely amazing so kids whatever your age you are if you're a big kid like me and as the offering baskets come round or if you want to walk forward um, I used to and I've, I haven't done it since COVID and I think I'm going to start it again see I give to the church from my salary and that goes by standing order that's a banking term for those of you who are young and don't know what that is so my money goes out from my account into BCC's account which is my tithe to the account and I don't see it it happens but sometimes it's practically a good thing for me to come prepared with some real money we've almost forgotten what real money is with some real money and that acts like that widow who came forward or when the offering came past to put something in reminds me that actually everything that I have, my life, the breath, standing here comes from the good Lord above. And so in a moment, uh, where's James and uh, Emily? They're going to lead us in a song. Kids, I'll come and join you as we use Deborah the Zebra. And then uh, when you've done that, parents, you can grab your kids and they're going to have an amazing time out at children's church and uh, we're going to have the offering baskets come around at the top and the bottom as we just remind ourselves that God's good and that we have much this is challenging times for everybody and I just want to say that if you are in great need then we want to know if you are in need please don't hesitate to come and ask some of us as pastors how we can help you because we want to help one another as family together. Is that okay? That's, I want you to hear that. We're here to help one another through these challenging times. 
Now faith is ready to give. So we're going to stand in honor of faith and we're going to worship together. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Your love is overwhelming towards us. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we can have complete and utter confidence in who you are, in your love towards us. Never runs out, never fails. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. Amen. Amen. Please do take your seats. Thanks so much, uh, James and Emily. Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, my name's uh, Tim. Uh, I'm one of the uh, 
I was going to say part of the team here. Yeah, I'm part of the team. And, uh, <laughs> and um, as uh, Roger said, we are diving into a new series this morning. I've just realized, <laughs> I've just seen the screen behind. I've been told not to wear black because it kind of contrasts with the black background and makes it look, for those of the people on the live stream, makes it look like I'm a floating head. So, you know, I am a real person for those of you who are just connecting online. So sorry about that. Um, that's my error. I have been told and I forgot. So we're starting this new series in Ezra and Nehemiah. We're going to be looking at these books uh, in the Bible that occur somewhere. If you've got kind of a physical Bible, they're somewhere near the middle. Uh, but they occur towards the end of the history of um, what's recounted in the Old Testament. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into the context uh, in just a moment. But as Roger said, this is really all about uh, this theme that we've kind of uh, taken over the next few weeks, rebuilding better together. This sense of unity in the rebuilding project that Ezra, Nehemiah, others that they found themselves into. There's a real sense of unity in the rebuilding, a coming together to fulfill the purposes of God. And there's some uh, key lessons and principles that we think uh, are really important for us as a church in these chapters. So we're going to be looking at Ezra, we're going to be looking at Nehemiah. These um, books take place in a particular context in Israel's history. The Israelites, uh, because of their disobedience, had been carried into exile by the Babylonians uh, somewhere around 580 years or so before Christ was born, somewhere around that period. They'd remained in exile for 70 years or so when a new king, the Persian king Cyrus, who we'll read more about in a second, he came along uh, from the south. He arrived in Babylon. And uh, do you remember a few weeks ago when we were in Daniel and we looked at um, Belshazzar and the Persians were kind of, I don't know if anyone remembers that far back, but, um, and um, uh, th this, is, this is all the kind of things that was happening then, and, and the, the Jews were in exile in Babylon, and then the king uh, Cyrus, the king of Persia, came up to Babylon uh, when Belshazzar was kind of partying and having a feast and doing all these kind of things, kind of resting in the security of the Babylonian empire. Uh, they came in and uh, took uh, the city. And um, so Cyrus comes and he finds all these uh, captives from not only Jewish people, from all kinds of other nations, and he basically issues this, this decree that they can and should go back to their home countries. And um, so I know I'm doing this a little bit out of order, Nikki, but there is actually a picture uh, that I just want to show you. And this is um, a, uh, if we can just flick it up on the screen, that'd be great. Um, this is something known as the Cyrus Cylinder. There it is. And this is in the British Museum. This was found by archaeologists in the 1870s in um, modern-day Iraq. And what that actually is, is the command of Cyrus to allow different nationalities to go back to their hometowns. Um, the Jews aren't specifically mentioned in this particular um, version this particular one, but it just kind of shows the historicity uh, of the Bible, that this King Cyrus, who's a Persian king who really existed, um, letting people go from Babylon back to their home countries. And so that's the kind of context that Ezra and Nehemiah were written in. They're both books about rebuilding. They're both books about, the, as the people travel back from Babylon, back to Jerusalem, they're about rebuilding. And actually, Ezra and Nehemiah are both very similar. The first half is very much about physical rebuilding. In Ezra, it's about rebuilding the temple. In Nehemiah, it's about, sorry, in, yeah, in Ezra, it's about ne um, rebuilding the temple. In Nehemiah, it's about rebuilding the walls of the city. But then the second half of both the books is also then about the kind of internal reform that also needed to go on. You see, it's all very well just rebuilding these external things, rebuilding the walls or rebuild, rebuilding the temple, but actually the people needed their hearts changed. And as we go through these books, one of the things that we're going to see is it is not just about the physical rebuilding, it's also about rededicating their hearts to God. As, they've, as, as the Jews go back from Babylon back towards Jerusalem, they need to rededicate and to re-give their hearts to God. There's that sense of, um, you know, where is the heart 
in this and rededication of their heart. Both Ezra and Nehemiah recount stories of opposition in the rebuilding work that goes on. And so there's a lot of similarities in those two books. Let's just take a little look at Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that's the one who made that decree earlier. Uh, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. And we saw an example of that proclamation Uh, or similar proclamation in the Cyrus Cylinder just there. Now, what is the word of the Lord that was given to Jeremiah? Well, let's just take a look look at that. So uh, I think refers to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10, which says, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So Jeremiah writing from Jerusalem to the Jewish people in exile in Babylon says when 70 years have passed when 70 years have been completed uh, I will uh, bring you back to Jerusalem now why 70 years what's going on about that 70 years and I think we find an answer there in so I know we're darting around all over scripture here I think we find an answer in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 it says Uh, He's talking about um, the Babylonian king here. He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his successors until the kingdom of Persia came to power. That's with Cyrus, right? The land, that's the land of Judea, Jerusalem, all that kind of area, enjoyed its Sabbath rests. All the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. There's this sense that as the Jews have been in Babylon in exile for 70 years, the land has been resting. Why? Because the people, uh, it seems, didn't keep the command to every um, uh, seventh year to allow the land to rest They didn't take seriously the command of God, and so they were going to be in exile for 70 years to give the land its Sabbath rests. And so the Jews returning uh, in Ezra chapter 1, as we just read there, the Jews returning from exile to Babylon is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah, but it's also a fulfillment of another prophecy from Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 45, many hundreds of years earlier, or a few hundred years earlier, we read that Cyrus is mentioned, that God is going to raise up his servant Cyrus to deliver his people out of captivity, to deliver them, to let them go back to the promised land, to let them go back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And the reason why I want to give you all of this kind of historical context and dot around the Bible a little bit is to try and show you this key point. That across the hand, the times of history, God has his hands on it. God fulfills the word that was given to the prophet Isaiah, the word that was given to the prophet Jeremiah. He has his hand. And so all these Jews who had been in captivity for 70, 80 years or so in Babylon are reminded of the sovereignty of God, reminded that he is a God who fulfills his promises. This is what was fulfilled through I, uh, as as the word was spoken to Jeremiah, as the word was spoken to Isaiah. God has his hand on history. He is not ignorant of the things that are going on. And in the midst of life, in the midst of crisis, I think that God wants his people to know he has not forgotten them. He does not leave his promises unfulfilled. And so there's a connection here in the return from exile in Babylon going back into the promised land there's a connection and there's a there's a kind of strong connected theme between um, when the Jews enter the land here uh, about uh, 500 years or so before Christ and when the Jews first entered the land um, a thousand years or so previous to that uh, during the time of Moses and the Exodus there's some similarities here there's a long journey followed by entering the land. There's a sense of plundering the Egyptians. We read in Ezra chapter 1 verse 6 that all their neighbours in Babylon gave them gold and silver to help them go back in the rebuilding um, process. One of the key leaders in Ezra 
the high priest, the first high priest, is even named Joshua. Reminds us of Joshua uh, who entered the promised land back in the book of Joshua. And of course, one of the key aims back for the, in the time of the Exodus was Moses going to Pharaoh saying, let me people go that they may worship me, that they may worship God. The key purpose of leaving bondage in slavery to, in Egypt or leaving bondage in slavery in Babylon, that they may worship God. But... This connection with Exodus, and we'll see it again here as we look at another prophecy in Isaiah chapter 43, is, de- it is designed to make us think of something greater. Look at Isaiah chapter 43, and we're going to see verses 16 to 19. By the way, we've got this, um, we've got this big banner in the hallway of the life center here that says, see, I am doing a new thing. See, I am doing a new thing. And that's very important to us. You know, see, God, today is the day of new things. But I want to show you now where that comes from. That verse comes from Isaiah chapter 43. Now, Isaiah is prophesying. He's anticipating the um, judgment that would come upon the Jews if they are not faithful, but then also their restoration, right? Also their restoration. He's prophesying this new exodus out of Babylon and back to the promised land. So in Isaiah 43, verse 16, we say, this is what the Lord says, he who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters. When did he make a way through the sea? When did he make a path through mighty waters? It's looking back to the Exodus, right? Isaiah is reminding the people, God through Isaiah is reminding the people, remember what I did back in the Exodus, right? Remember that time when God split the waters and you passed through on dry land, and then the waters were closed up over the Egyptian army. Remember those things. This is what the Lord says. Who drew out the chariots and horses, verse 17, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. So God says, I'm the God who brought you out of slavery in Egypt. Well, I'm the God who, when you came out of slavery in Egypt, the waters passed, the waters parted, they were dry and you passed through them. I'm that God, says God through Isaiah. But, verse 18, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. And here it comes, verse 19. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. What's God through the prophet Isaiah saying here? That, that, that exodus back in the day of Moses, you ain't seen nothing yet. Right? Because God is doing a new thing that is going to make the former thing look small. Right? There's a new exodus about to take place for these Jews who are going to be returning back into the promised land. There's a new exodus here. But I don't think it's literally that they are to forget what God has done, as in, you know, don't, but I, I think it's more don't look back on the glory days. I think this is, is don't be nostalgic. Sometimes we can be so easy to be uh, nostalgic, can't we? Sometimes we can long back to the former days with the sense of nostalgia, looking back as if they were the glory days. But God is doing something new in this day. Look for the work of God today in this time. And so the Jews start to go back, and the first half of chapter, uh, the first half of, sorry, of the book of Ezra, we read about um, Zerubbabel and Joshua leading the people back. Ezra's still in Babylon at this time. He comes back later. He goes back later. And we read about the work that they started to do. And we're going to pick it up as um, we we read in a lot of uh, chapter two of all the different families who are returning uh, back to uh, Jerusalem. We're going to pick it up in chapter three, and I'm going to read from verse one in chapter three. So that's all by way of introduction. Um, Come on, Tim, get to the main point. Right, here we go. Ezra chapter 3, verse 1. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. In coming together, there was unity. They came together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, verse 2, son of Josadak and his fellow priests and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel and his associates, began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundations and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening sacrifices. 
Then in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the festival of tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. The festival of tabernacles, of course, is really kind of um, uh, significant for this period, isn't it? Because the festival of tabernacles remembers and kind of celebrates the time when uh, the Israelites wandered around in tents. Again, that's a kind of reference to the fact that there's a new exodus taking place here. After that, verse 5, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those bought as freewill offerings to the Lord. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, through the foundation of, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. Look at that again in verse 3. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built an altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings. Despite the challenges, despite the threats that they faced, there were still people, as they went back to Jerusalem, there were still people in that land, you know, many of them hostile to the faithfulness that these Jews had shown to uh, God. And despite the fear of those people around them, they prioritized building the altar as one, as a united people. In coming to build the, the altar, there was unity. Their first priority was to the presence of God and to acknowledging the presence of God. That is their first priority. The first priority, I think we could say, is worship. Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message translation of the Bible, says this, worship is the strategy by which we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves and attend to the presence of God. It's good, that, isn't it? Worship is the strategy by which we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves, the fear that we've got about all these other kind of things, all that kind of my-centeredness, all that kind of thing. It's the way, it's the chief way in which we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves and attend to the presence of God, the priority of the presence of God. You see, worship, so often we get, I think, um, concerned and wrapped up in the how. But it's all about the who. It's all about the who. Worship is the way, the strategy that we use to orientate our lives off of myself and onto the presence of God. And then we read a little bit further on in verse 7 in Ezra chapter 3. Then they gave money to the masons and the carpenters, and they gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre, so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa, as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. In the second month of the second year, after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, and the rest of the priests, the priests and the Levites, and, and all who had returned from the captivity to Jerusalem, began the work. They appointed Levites 20 years old and older to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons uh, and brothers and Cadmiel and his sons, descendants of Hodaviah and the sons of Henadad and their sons and brothers, all Levites joined together in supervising those working on the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. All the people again coming together, unity there, building together. Verse 12, but many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of the temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the noise of, of, of the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. Interesting, isn't it? As the 
foundations of the temple are being laid there. There's much rejoicing, very reminiscent of the kind of praise that took place during David's era. And actually, they're using the words of David, aren't they? You know, the, 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 he is good, his love endures forever, very much kind of um, in reference to the Davidic worship that happened hundreds of years earlier. But those who were older wept. The temple was not quite as good as they remembered it in the past, those who were old and could remember the former temple before it was destroyed. The stones weren't quite as big, perhaps, or the, the area wasn't, wasn't quite as majestic, wasn't quite as, as splendorous as it was before. And I think what's happening here is the, the, the old people, they've got that sense of nostalgia for the old days. They're not doing what Isaiah had told them to do. See, the Lord is doing a new thing. They haven't quite remembered, they haven't quite, they haven't quite grasped that, you know, this is a new day and, you know, it's not the same as the old day. God is doing a new thing. But the thing is, I think that those verses that we looked at earlier from Isaiah chapter, where was it, 43, uh, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 to 19, see, I'm a do th I am doing a new thing, says God, ultimately points us to Christ ultimately points us to Christ because the first temple, the one that Solomon had built that had been destroyed, lasted in the region of 500 years. As, as Zerubbabel and Joshua and these guys that we've just read about are, are laying the foundation of this temple, that would last about 500, year, 500 years or so. But it points us to something greater. Jesus is doing a new thing. Because in John chapter 2, I'm pretty sure, uh, John chapter 2, Jesus says, destroy the temple and I will rebuild it in three days. But he's not talking about the physical temple. He's not talking about the rebuilding and the kind of project that Zerubbabel and Joshua were doing here. He's talking about himself. Why? Because he is the embodiment of the presence of God. He is the very presence of God walking among people. See, God has done a new thing. See, God has done a new thing in coming among us through Christ. This is all about for us. I think, you know, this is just such a simple thing for us today to hear from the text. Because it's all about prioritizing the presence of Jesus. It's all about prioritizing the presence of God. That's what we see Zerubbabel, Joshua, the Israelites doing as they return from captivity in Babylon back to Jerusalem they build the altar they come together united despite you know the the fear and the oppression of others and we're going to see opposition and we're going to see opposition to the work that they faced here and then in Nehemiah as well but they've got that sense of coming together around the priority of the presence of God see God is doing a new thing and for us today I think he has done a new thing in Christ, that through the death and resurrection of Christ has made a way for us to experience the presence of God, not in a temple in Jerusalem anymore, but wherever we are, we can experience and know the presence of Jesus. And I think for all of us, the challenge of, of, of Eugene Peterson's comes to us again. Worship is the strategy by which we put aside the preoccupation with ourselves and attend to the presence of Jesus. And that's, that's what it's all about because there are so many things when I look into my own life that seek to divert and distract us from the priority of the presence of Jesus. So many things. We see a small example of this in Luke chapter 10 where Mary and Martha are um, hosting Jesus and Martha is so busy doing so many things to make sure that the uh, table is set and the food is just so and everything has been uh, put right. But Mary just sitting at the feet of Jesus and Jesus says she has chosen the great thing, the greater thing. Corrie ten Boom, the Dutch uh, writer and theologian said, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Isn't that true? So many things I'm aware in my own life seek to distract divert, pull us away from the priority of the presence of Jesus. And I think the first lesson we learn from the Jews who are returning back to Jerusalem is that corporate sense of seeking the presence of God together. That's what they did. They come together, rebuild the altar, and there's opposition, and they didn't get everything right, and they still need to reform their hearts, and there's lots of work that will go as we seek. But first of all, it's about the presence of God 
in our midst. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that through Christ you have done a new thing, that through the ongoing presence of the Spirit with us today, you are continuing to do new things in our midst. And Lord, I, I pray that in the midst of so many things that seek to distract, that seek to divert, that pull us away from prioritizing the presence of God in our lives, Lord, that by your Spirit you would gently draw us back. You would put in us a hunger and thirst that transcends our circumstances. That we would have that heart, take the world, but give me Jesus. That we, like, like Moses, would say, if you don't go with us, we're not taking a step from this place. Lord, that like, like the ancient Israelites coming back out of captivity, we would say our first priority is to attend to the presence of God in our midst. Oh Lord, forgive us when we become so busy, so busy with many other things. I pray that by your spirit you would lead us into greater seeking you, to know your presence, to attend to your presence, not just in this moment, but tomorrow and the next day, that we would be, first of all, people of your presence. Amen. Amen. Thanks, team. James and Emily, do you guys want to come up and lead us? I invite you, if you're able, to stand with us, guys, and let's put this into practice now, prioritizing his presence, creating that space, that room to worship, that coming together in unity to be an effective body in his kingdom. That's what we want to be here at BCC. Effective for his, his kingdom, a, a unified body. So as we worship, let's orientate our lives, our hearts toward him. And that's what worship does. It creates that room, that, that space to focus on him, focus our attention on him. Give him number one place in our lives. Let's let worship be our number one priority too. Keeping that at all times. And, and if there's an area of your heart, of your life, where you feel like you need God to rebuild, to welcome Him in as the master builder, the master rebuilder and restorer, and you feel like there's an area of your life that you need Him to come and rebuild, then there are people around who want to be praying for you. I think they'll be at the back. But seek them out. Let them pray with you in that as we worship. Thanks, James.
The presence of the Lord is with us and here now. We can receive from him. Yes. He's worthy of it all. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In a moment, we're going to conclude with uh, a song of praise before we eat together. Um, um, everybody is welcome. Balcony guys, you're welcome. Down here, you're welcome. If it's your first time, you are definitely welcome to come and eat with us because uh, we like to do food and family. And I want you to just make that point. Um, wasn't that a masterclass in preaching? So that's a master. I can't do that, but that's okay 
because God made me my, me. And God made you like you. And he takes us all together as a big family and blends us all up in this holy mess and goes, right, get on with it. And we go, ooh. So we've said this before, if you're not dead, you're not done. So there's a place and a work for you to do for Jesus. Isn't that good? You don't have to be like James or Emily. You definitely don't want to be like me. You could be like Tim, but there's a place for all of us. But the place that we all come together is the who, not the how. And the who is the Lord Jesus. And we get to serve and worship him. That's good, isn't it? Really, really good. And if you want to be involved, then you can grab one of the people that you've seen uh, either at the front or at the back at the giving station. Say, how do I get involved? And they'll let you know because we love you to be part of the family. Well, you're going to lead us in a, a time of worship and praise. When they're done, it's don't all rush at once, but we'll give you the cue. Let those who are our guests, and they won't go forward, so just grab them and say, come, let's eat together. Okay, is that all right? Good. Praise together? What are we singing? <laughs> you don't know, but you do know. I know. <laughs> Love you, mate. God bless. Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen one.
So it's at reception, if that's you and you realise you can't get very far without them. Time to pick up the kids, if you've got kids out in kids' church. Otherwise, enjoy the food as family together. Bless you guys. See you next week. <laughs>